Hi, I'm Jill Burke. I'm Professor of Renaissance Visual and Material Cultures at the University of Edinburgh. And this video is about how I do visual analysis. Now, I'll just share my screen. I was going to call this video how to do visual analysis, but then I thought that's just not quite right because ideally, everyone who does visual analysis and you might need to do this if you study art history um, at any level if you're interested in um, extending your writing skills or if you work as a curator or work in um, exhibitions or anything it's a really useful skill and ideally you should kind of find your own voice and this is the whole point because this is a writing exercise so i'm talking about how i write visual analysis because i know that examples can be uh, really helpful but this is not a blueprint for how you have to do something. Um, there's plenty of other uh, resources online, like the Khan Academy, if you want a kind of tick box um, idea of how to approach um, images. Um, but this is how I do it, and this is how I've done it for quite a long time. The first question, I suppose, is, is why? Why do you describe objects as well? When I first started in art history, I came from a history degree, and the um, punction, the uh, liking that art historians had for description kind of annoyed me. I was thinking there's a there's an image, there's an illustration of this painting right there on the page. Why are you also describing it? Um, but as I've been in art history now for a couple of decades, more, I um, have really realized the importance of description for various reasons. And the first reason is that we're dealing with objects and images that are in another language, right? They're not in a verbal language, not in a language that use wor uses words. So we need to translate those objects. So if you can think of description and visual analysis as a kind of translation. It also forces you to slow right down and be patient and be developing skills of patient looking and writing is really helpful. Invariably, if you describe an object, you will see things that you haven't seen before. Uh, so it's really important to get into the habit of doing that, of looking carefully. It's also not just simply a description, but more an evocation. Um, so you're evoking not just what the image looks like, but also what the image conveys in terms of meaning, in terms of feelings um, to an audience. And it ensures that when you're going ahead to further analysis, that you and the audience understand the same thing, are looking at the image in the same way and seeing the same things. So it's about establishing a common language as well. The third reason is that the art history is based really on ekphrasis, on the description of works of art. And this uh, literary exercise of, of description and evocation goes back literally thousands of years to classical times and was something that Giorgio Vasari, the father of art history, um, goes in for a lot in, um, in his book, The Lives of the Artists. And this is a very common thing um, that, uh, common literary exercise in the Renaissance, um, where there wasn't, of course, um, uh, such uh, images that, that very closely reproduced uh, works of art that weren't there. Um, there. So there's a, that's a reason as well. It's just a tradition. And lastly, it's difficult. That sounds kind of counterintuitive, but it's if you're interested in writing, this is a really good exercise to do because it really, really helps you um, hone your writing and discover your own voice. And being good at writing is such an essential tool for so many different types of um, activity. All right, so imagine, even if you're in an exam, for example, if you do a history exam or, or you're working in a place and, and someone comes along with a painting, you know, that they found in their attic or something like that, if you're working in a museum or a, an auction house and you know nothing about it. So what do you do? The first thing is don't panic, right? Okay, you might know nothing about it, but you can see, you can see stuff about it already. So we're gonna start off with the object that's here. And this is an object that is not my normal things. I, I tend to work on people's bodies. So I tend to work on nakedness and stuff. And this is just a, a selection of objects, um, a, a genre that we normally call a still life. 
Um, and that's exactly the kind of thing that I don't work on. So I'm deliberately doing something that's a little bit out of my comfort zone, but I'm not panicking, notice. So you start off with what can we see? Look slowly, look carefully, look closely and write a brief description of the object. That's step one. And step two is what do we need to find out to help us interpret the object more closely, right? And that's basically what you have to do in visual analysis. That's basically all you have to do in visual analysis. Okay, so let's start with a surface description of this painting. And this is my description. Placed upon a table in a seemingly random fashion are a collection of objects. An intricately worked cream ceramic vase to our left, so stuffed with an abundance of colourful flowers that some have fallen out, scattered on the table. The leaves jutting out over the edge into our space to the lower left, uh, jutting out over the ledge here into our space on the lower left. Next to that, dominating the centre of the composition is a round scalloped white faience bowl full of dried fruits dates, almonds, and white sweetmeats. At the center, just at the edge of our table, is a golden goblet. Its lid sporting a classicizing male figure with staff and shield, evoking the shape of an ecclesiastical chalice. Perhaps like the glass behind the bowl, it contains wine. Okay, so that's just a starting point. Um, I haven't really looked at all the sides of the picture. I'm going to go on to do that in a, in a little while. But just to say already, it doesn't have to be like a, oh, there is a bowl in the middle of the table. Next to it is a vase of flowers. It can be a little bit more playful, a little bit more descriptive, a little bit more interesting than that if you want it to be. If you're, you're, you're lacking in confidence, you can absolutely say there's a white bowl at the center of the table. It contains dates and almonds. Um, it has a, a, a gilt goblet in front of it at our left hand side of the panel there is a vase of flowers you can just go through that like that but I like to mix it up a little bit let's try let's carry on with this description and look more closely at the painting okay now I'm going to reveal that who this painting is by because normally you'd, you'd have a sense of who this painting is by in these situations it's by Clara Peters and it's very long official title is still life with flowers a silver gilt glob goblet gob goblet goblet almonds dried fruits sweet meats breadsticks wine and a pewter picture it was made in 1611 it's 52 by 73 it's always really useful to understand the size of objects you're looking at and it's in uh, the prada museum in madrid it's really useful also to know where these objects are held because that means that you can find uh, find them on the museum website and you often get really good information and good images on museum websites. Okay, let's look closer at this pewter, um, this pewter vessel on the uh, right hand side of the picture. If you look really closely, you'll see there's a reflection here. The re reflection of a window and even more closely here, you can see a white blob and a headdress, this is a face. This is a face, a reflection of a face. Similarly, here you can just make out, there's also a reflection of a face on the gilt goblet at the uh, front. This is the reflection of the face of the painter. Isn't it good that we looked really closely and slowly at this painting because obviously it contains more than might meet the eye at first glance. So let's look closer and add to our description. The artist here shows her skills of observation as she shows how the fall of light through transparent substances changes the colour of wine from a dark crimson to a startling scarlet. Again, don't just say this, the wine changes colour, show what the artist is doing to create effects, okay? The glass itself was of Italian origin and made in Antwerp at the time by Italian immigrants. So that's just from a Google Italian, um, you know, glass in Antwerp or, or from the a museum website, you know, find out these things about each object. The right hand side of the composition seems more domestic in tone to the, uh, compared to the left. At the front, a circular pewter bowl contains curved breadsticks and scattered white sweets as if discarded during a meal. Behind this stands a dark metallic picture or jug, ready to pour the wine perhaps, 
but the reflections on its curved surface demands their attention. Geometric areas of white light bounce off a surface, and if we look closely, we can see two tiny reflections of the artist, one upside down, shining in the light. We see the reflection again if we peer closely at the central goblet. A miniature Clara Peters looks back at us in tiny smudges of paint. Okay, so after your initial, I've done a little bit of context in the last paragraph with the Italian immigrants, right? You can add it there. This is not a, um, a standardised list of things that you have to follow. But basically, after you've done your close description, then think about contextualization. You need to think about who was the artist, who, who made this, or the maker, who, who made this, um, what context were they living in? Um, do we know who the artist was definitely? Is it definitely a one person or another? What's the evidence for this? And um, this is particularly important in um, pre-modern art, um, art before about 1700, 1800, when it's not always clear, but also relevant to more recent things. Who was the patron, if relevant? Or who was the original um, or um, audience. Who was this intended for? Um, where was the object originally seen? What was the original context? Again, for pre-modern art, you know, it's, it wasn't the original context was not an art gallery. It was somewhere else. What was it for? What was its function? What was it trying to do to, uh, to the audience? Does the object still look like it uh, was, did when it was first made? What's the condition? Some objects are cut down. Sometimes the pigment um, deteriorates. Sometimes varnish cracks. Um, sometimes things are painted over. Um, there's some really interesting examples of that, actually. Um, but you do need to have an eye, um, particularly again on older things about what they looked like originally and whether we're seeing um, anything uh, like uh, and seeing the object in the condition that was anything like it used to be. Can we usefully compare it to other works? So sometimes. If, uh, image comparisons bring in interesting um, uh, narratives if you look at uh, different things. So I always suggest, even if you're focusing on one image to bring in comparisons. And is there any scholarship that I can engage with? And as obviously later, any primary sources, written primary sources that we can engage with. Um, so this image was made by Clara Peters, whose uh, self-portrait is here. You may recognize um, this object. Yeah, um, and she's one of many female artists who were working in the late 16th and 17th centuries. And she's uh, had, an, and there's an exhibition of her work in the Prado um, a couple of years ago. Um, here she is again. Look at that um, bubble here. Yeah. Very nice, she's very good. Um, so contextualization, what would you compare with? Well, it's a still life, isn't it? And so when did still life start? Why, when did um, images of flowers start? And this image uh, came to my mind. It's by Joris Hofnagel. Um, and it's the beginning of, um, and it's an image that he, he made for his mum, actually, um, as a token of his, his love, which is very sweet. And it's basically giving her flowers. Um, so he's giving her this painted image of flowers with, um, a moth and caterpillars and and so very um, pretty uh, image um, and the development of this kind of flower drawing this development of this kind of work is closely related to botanical illustration so you could bring in for example um, other botanical illustrations too and we'll do that in the next step but I'll just give you this next paragraph a medley of textures surfaces reflections and a multi multiplicity of colors this is a panel that demands patient looking this patience is, according to Lucia Tongiorgi Tomasi, so again, I'm bringing in a secondary source material, uh, a source, uh, a secondary scholar here. This patience is a quality associated with women artists. Certainly, Clara Peters worked patiently in a very many minutely rendered still lives that became hugely popular in the first half of the 17th century in her native Holland and well beyond, leaving 31 works that show her signature between 1607 and 1621. Unfortunately, there is little recorded about her life beyond her works. What we do know is that she was one of the pioneers of still life painting, said to have its roots in scientific illustration. In fact, this image of 1589 by the Netherlandish polymath Joris Hofnagel is often called the first still life painting. It's no accident that it presents flowers for his mother. These images so often are a tribute to the powers of observation and, awaking, and a way of making the beauties of nature into a permanent gift. Okay, so you can see how I've juxtaposed those images together and made a kind of narrative out of it. 
more contextualization. Let's look closer and closer at this image. Let's look at the flowers. We've been talking about flowers with her Nagel, so let's look at them more closely. I wonder what flowers they are. Where did she get her idea of presenting flowers like this from? Now, in the um, late 16th, early 17th century, you get a series of books called Florilegium, which are collections of flowers, um, which are painted both for naturalists, but also to collect at home. So that would be a good reference, maybe, to, to think about contextualizing the object like that. Um, here again is a, uh, a collection of um, botanical illustrations. This is also clearly related to close depiction of flowers. So we can maybe locate this painting as well in the context of early modern scientific investigation. Often these objects are brought in, often um, these objects, these florilegium, early modern scientific um, illustration and, and books of botany, what we'd now call botany and things like that. Often they were reused for women um, to use as embroidery patterns. So maybe we could even go further and find another object to compare it with that is not um, a 2D illustration, not a drawing, an engraving of a painting, but something else like this waistcoat, uh, this embroidered, very beautiful embroidered woman's waistcoat um, from the early um, 17th century. So it's a similar kind of period um, to the period that Clara Peters was working in. And, and this was uh, kind of embroidery was popular throughout Europe. So we can maybe bring that in as well for our analysis. And furthermore, women were also very involved in botanical illustration. And here I'm showing an image by Maria Sibylla Merian, who is a really important late uh, 17th century, early 18th century um, botanical illustrator. And you can show the careful looking that she employs in um, this passage she writes about, about this um, little uh, blue flower, its caterpillars and the associated butterflies. Um, so I'm going to put all this together in, in the next paragraph. Okay. Like many other women who painted flowers, Peters' influences seem to be related to scientific observation, particularly the tradition of illustrated herbals, which in turn gave women designs for, for traditional feminine pursuits of embroidery and lace making. In fact, Peters' flowers in this painting from tulips to narcissi to roses, had been linked to printed images by the earliest early Netherlands engraver, Adrian Collet. So that's this image here. And it seems that she took her, her, her images perhaps directly from him. She shared this link between her artistic pursuits and early scientific works with many of her female counterparts, such as those artists related to the Academia de Linche, the Academy of the Lynx Eyed, which was founded in Rome in 1603. These links point up the importance of slow looking, of careful observation over a long period of time before committing images to canvas, paper or panel. We can see this in action perhaps in the later German naturalist and artist Maria Sibylla Merian's work. For example, her account of watching the peas bottom moth. And she says, I've often seen hovering over the little blue flowers um, of Consalia regalis, this enchanting little moth that I depict here. So well known it is for its beauty and unusual colouring that I find myself wondering more than once from what caterpillar it might spring. I therefore pursued my research until I found the caterpillars I was looking for on the flowers of this very plant, to which they cause great damage, since they not only like to feed upon them, but often devour the leaves and flowers with such veracity that they leave the stem completely bare. I have portrayed one of these small moths in the centre of the picture, poised on two green leaves, the more to delight the eye of the nature lover and the more attentive and acute the eye is, and to lend luster to this tiny work of art of indefatigable nature. And in my visual analysis, I'd use this quote in full because it displays so in such a beautiful way, how really close looking is employed in this period when people look at nature and how actually this kind of really intense observation can lead to insights into the processes of the natural world. So what leaves us what, uh, the only thing that, that is left for us to do now is to round all these observations up into a conclusion. And this is a conclusion um, that, I that I've written for this um, um, piece of analysis. 
This careful looking, this patience, was perhaps central to much of the art produced by women at the turn of the 17th century. Nature was observed over time and represented minutely, carefully, carefully and patiently. To return to Clara Pater's image, working with time in myriad ways, the painting both shows a fleeting moment, the bitten pretzel, the hazy image of the artist, but also suggests the eternity of nature, the flowers of different seasons. It shows the richness of possessions, the gold cup, the faience bowl, the wine glass, but also the inevitability, perhaps, of death. Okay, so that's my visual analysis. The total was 860 words, and I hope what it's done is teach you or make you look at the painting a different way um, now than you did right at the beginning of the lecture when we were first saying, oh my word, there's a painting I haven't seen before, what shall I do with it? So these are my tips, top tips, visual analysis. Describe first, at least in note form, before writing up a short version of your description. What are you seeing? Always start just by jotting down what you see whenever you're dealing with any object that is non-verbal. Don't use overly flowery language. It's not necessary. Use your own language, right? Often people try and be, pretend that they're art historians and think, oh, I've got to put in chiaroscuro, I've got to put in contrapositive, I've got to put in all these fancy words. Um, and they're often misused. Used, it's fine to use them if you know how to use them, if you're confident, and that's the kind of way you could talk it to a friend. But if you don't know how to use them, um, just, just keep it as with simple, plain, clear language. Um, you know, you've got to walk before you can run, okay? Don't use value judgments. Um, unless you're trying to sell a painting um, or an object, which you might well be in one time of your career, you don't need to use value judgments in academic art history. So now, oh, this is the most important artist in the world. Or, oh, look at those exquisite brush strokes. I really hate that in seeing that in student work. Um, it bugs me. Um, other colleagues might feel differently, but I just, we're not here to evaluate whether it's a great quality, we're here to analyze it. Um, we're practicing art history and not art criticism. Um, that's a whole different genre. And if you wanna do that, that's fine, but that's not what we're talking about here. Compare it always to other images. What does it look like? Does it remind you of anything else? How can this comparison bring out interesting observations uh, that are more general um, than just looking at one object? Try to establish facts, right? Um, so try to establish dates, the original location first before making any assumptions. So it's a really good idea to just make sure that, that the, the um, what in um, catalogs is called the tombstone. Uh, so that's the name of the artist, the title of the patron, the um, materials, date, and current location of the object. Make sure that they're all secure. So it might be that it's called, that this object is attributed to an artist. Um, so we don't know for sure it's by this artist. You need to absolutely check that it's secure before you, then you go on to say, oh, this is by Clara Peters in there. And, and there wasn't any problems with this object, but there can be. So you need to absolutely check that dating and stuff is correct. And practice. Go to art galleries and museums with a notebook. I always, always um, go to exhibitions with a notebook. I always um, go around the first time by myself because I'm such a boring companion with exhibitions uh, and exhibitions and write things down, get your, even sketch things around, make your impressions, choose um, a limited number of objects to focus on rather than just dotting around from one to another. And then after that, after you've looked at things, then you can start to talk to other people. Okay, um, I think that is it. So yeah, I hope um, that this has been useful. And um, just to remember, to remind you again, this is just my way of doing things. Um, I have a, a lot of other examples of this kind of visual analysis on my research blog. Um, you can get that if you Google Jill Burke's blog. If you want to find other types of visual analysis, because I'm not the only art historian out there, if you um, Google, again, visual analysis, you'll get a lot of um, different ways of doing it. Um, and the thing is that you have to find your way. But once you get there, you'll find it a really invaluable way to make you look really closely at paintings. And, um, and honestly, like me, you will be a visual analysis convert. OK, thank you. <laughs>